Recording in progress. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. So today we are talking about music. Um, I'm going to go through this hopefully pretty quickly because, well, pretty much everybody knows music. Everybody likes music. Um, I think there is one, read about it somewhere, some small segment of the population that has a, a neurological issue where they just don't hear music. Like they hear notes, but to them it just sounds like noise. Um, so very, very tiny subsegment of the population that doesn't like music, pretty much everybody else in the world likes music. Um, and we all have different tastes. Tastes change over time. Things evolve over time and across cultures, but we all appreciate music to one degree or another. Um, so let's take a look at it. Now, I'll let you read these terms on your own. This might be useful if you're writing an essay about music, but I'm gonna hit a couple of the big ones. Though the ones that I think are important. Affect. This is this to me is probably the most important part because I'm more about the analysis than the form. I'm not a musician. I'm a, a professor and an anal analytical type. So what emotion, what emotional content does the music have? And this can be down to, it can be the lyrics, it can be the tone of voice, or it can be the literal music. Um, so like a percussive beat gets your blood riled, it gets you kind of stirred up, it's a, got a martial tone to it. <clears throat> Whereas um, softer things can calm you, can soothe you. The melody, that's the, the, the sequence of pitches and durations, kind of the common uniting theme. Um, harmony, that's when two or more two or more chords are played together. That doesn't necessarily mean they sound good. They can be consonant or dissonant. Um, dissonant means they jar, they don't sound right together, and it's unpleasant. Consonant means they're pleasant together, but both are harmony. Uh, and, and our idea of consonants and dissonance changes over time. What, you know, today's rock and roll music or rap or whatever would sound like garbage to somebody from the 1800s because it's just so different. Um, what we say, what we think as good music to them sounds like disjointed noise. I'm guessing I've never met anybody from the 1800s, but that's the idea. Um, tempo, that's the, the way it's played, the speed, rhythm, you know what that is. Beat, I want to talk about beat for a second because we've got a video that's just amazing. Um, mostly in Western music, you will hear 3-4 or 4-4 four, four time. Uh, for a good example of those together and being changed up, take a listen to the Beatles' um, Happiness is a Warm Gun because they switch from 3-4 to 4-4 four, four and then back. Or maybe it's the other way around, 4-4, 3-4, 4-4. Four, 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 four. You, you get what I mean. But it's three beats to the bar or four beats to the bar, to the section of music on the page separated by bars. Um, three, three, four time is like a waltz. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And it's very common. It's very pretty easy to identify. Um, you can also talk about four, four beats. They're very common in music, but I gave you those. I want to, I want you to be aware of those because I want you to listen to this video. Um, Again, most music is three, four, four, four time, three or four beats to the bar. This is an example of Boogie Woogie, which is, uh, it was a style popular in the 40s and 50s. Have you ever noticed, ladies and gentlemen, that? This is Liberace, uh, a very famous piano player from the 60s and 70s, 50s, 60s and 70s, I should say. He was also um, very gay, like just flamboyantly gay. Um, and in a time where being gay was a career death, it was a social stigma. It was not a good thing uh, to be public, publicly out. And everybody knew Liberace was gay. But my contention is he plays so damn well that the kind of bigoted homophobic audience of the time was like, yeah, maybe he's gay, who cares? Let's just pretend he's not because wow. Um, which, you know, glad we live in modern times. Allow people to be people. But anyway, yeah, he is just so damn talented. And in this video, he plays Boogie Woogie. 
which is typically played eight to the bar. So it's twice as fast as what we think of as normal music. Um, in fact, there's a famous boogie woogie song called Beat Me Daddy Eight to the Bar. A pretty good song. Uh, the Andrew Sisters do a cover. Um, but yeah, and then just to show you how damn good he is, he proceeds to play 16 to the bar, four times the speed of what we think of as normal music. And it's just, wow. Liberace was a talent for the ages. Um, it's, he's amazing. It's just mind blowing to me. Um, so yeah, that's a good example of beat. And then watch this Elements of Music video. It is admittedly for a younger age group, but we it's still valuable information and it explains it pretty simply and pretty straightforwardly. Um, so I, I'm a fan of that one. So give that a watch. Uh, other things, monophony, counterpoint, homophony, that's using together same rhythm, um, polypho polyphony, as in like polyphonic spree. These are different things. One thing to know about music is that the way you play it can change. Um, it's more than just the notes on the page. Playing something soft or hard, uh, that would be piano, pianissimo or forte, are the, I think, Italian terms, can drastically change it. So take a look at this example of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, which is written by Mozart, bet you didn't know that. Um, but it's, I'll play a few seconds of it for you just to, Stop there because they it's got like two verses for some damn reason. Um, let's get bad a little. Notice how it's the same melody, but they're playing it differently. It's a variation. Um, Again, completely different tune, but the same music. Uh, so that's my, my larger point. Um, hopefully I don't get a copyright strike on this. I got one on a previous video for showing a clip of somebody else's movie. Yeah, stupid YouTube. Anyway, um, yeah, the way you play it can change things. So you can hear the, two, the same song in two completely different ways and ultimately with two completely different meanings. So yeah, it's, it's more versatile than you might've thought. This one's the one I got in trouble for. I'll just pull it up. I won't play too much. But um, the thing about music, the thing that makes it so powerful, at least to me, is that it is probably the oldest art form because music predates humanity. It's not dependent on our language. It's not dependent on our knowledge. It's just there. It exists in the natural world. Uh, I like this video. It's from Zatoichi, the blind swordsman. Zatoichi was, is a fairly famous character in Japan. He's a, Zatoichi means number one masseur, like a male version of a masseuse. Somebody goes around and gives massages. And in China and Japan, and I think Korea, there is a long history of blind people acting at or serving and getting jobs as massage givers um, because that's, you know, that's a way that they can earn a living for themselves. So he goes around as a blind massage person and is also secretly a master swordsman. So Zatoichi, the blind swordsman, there are multiple versions of the movie or multiple, you know, iterations of the character, kind of like Zorro, like every, you know, 10, 20 years, they make a new one just for the new generation. It's, it's good stuff. This one is a particularly good version, but I like it because almost all of the music in it is natural. It's the sound of the rain. It's the sound of these farmers you know, stomping the patties flat and then making a dance of it. It's, yeah. Music comes from the natural world. Um, a great example would be the pan pipes or the pan flute, which, not video, image. Hopefully I don't get anything just too horrible. Yeah. See this guy blowing over him and it's, it's reeds. It's hollow reeds cut to different lengths to produce different sounds. And you can see almost immediately where that comes from of, you know, 
somebody's walking by a lake or something where a bunch of reeds grow and they hear the wind going and ooh, music. So music originates in the natural world. It is a part of our world, it's a part of our cosmos and it's just really cool. Um, some, some traditions, uh, mostly kind of modern mystical type, um, argue that God didn't speak the universe into existence. God sang the universe into existence, which is neither here nor there, but it's, it's kind of an indic indicative of how core music is to our world. And then here we have the evolution of music. Blah, blah. Um, and it goes through a lot of different ages, a lot of different styles. One thing you might notice is the, the how should I put this? Um, often there is a religious role to music or a religious link. It starts as songs of praise, songs of worship. And you can see that coming from the natural world as, oh, the gods make music with the world, therefore we should offer it back to them. You can see that you can see where somebody might be coming from if they if their culture had that viewpoint. But I think this is really neat. It gets you a lot of interesting examples of music throughout the ages and across cultures. So it's worth checking out. Um, yeah. Now then, a couple things. We have several slides on genre. I'm going to let you read most of this by yourself, but because, well, it's no point in me sitting here reading it for you. But uh, I wanted to point out that basically almost all music, most of what you think of as good music, owes something to Black America, African American culture, slave culture in many cases. Uh, something we might have seen this semester is that often great pain seems to result in great art, which is not to say that, oh, yeah, it totally justifies the enslavement of other people because they made great music. They must have been happy. Screw that noise. But it's, it's interesting that uh, it does seem to be a correlation that pain and art or pain and beauty go together. But yeah, um, blues is the quintessential American genre. Well, blues and jazz. Um, blues comes very much out of the slave culture of the Deep South. Uh, it doesn't have much in the way of percussion because slaves weren't allowed to have drums because, oh, they're recreating their African religion must be, must convert to our religion. Slaveholders kind of sucked. Uh, I, I feel okay making that statement. Um, but yeah, so much of the blues influenced rock and roll. Uh, I don't know if it necessarily influenced gospel, but they kind of grew up together. It's, they're both, you know, making music out of great pain. And so they, they share a lot in common. And I'm going to go ahead, ahead and say that gospel is the best form of worship music uh, because it's the only happy form of worship music I've heard. Um, to borrow from Eddie Izzard, a comedian, you know, you go to, he was British, so I'll do a slight British accent. You go to white Protestant churches and they're all singing, God is great. He's so wonderful. Just sounds so dour, you know. It's, um, whereas gospel is upbeat, it's positive. It's you can feel it. It's got a lot more of that affect. Um, yeah, but rock and roll, rap, jazz. Uh, what else is there? Country music owes a lot to Black America, in particular the banjo, which is an instrument from Africa. And the slaves who brought it over or recreate, you know, brought the knowledge how to make one, showed their slave masters how to play it, and it became deeply embedded in Southern American culture. So, yeah, um, about the only thing I can think of that isn't African American, and at least in part, would be like band music, not big band or swing, but like, uh, you know, marching band, like John Philip Sousa. And a lot of that's crap. Um, and as we'll see in a minute, the marching bands, uh, the modern marching band, owes a lot to Black culture. American music is Black at its core. And I think that's something important to understand. I think that's something that's very powerful. It speaks to the, the American intermelding of cultures. We, we take and we influence and at our best, which admittedly, you know, we are barely at our best, there's you know, 400 years of slavery and abuse, 
but at our best, we, we learn from each other and we grow and we build something new together. Um, and, and there are elements of that here. There, that happens. So, you know, excuse me for being kind of pie in the sky fantasy optimist, but it speaks to the, the ability of our cultures and our peoples to, to come together and make something beautiful, even when our history always hasn't always allowed that. So, excuse me for waxing philosophical. Um, but yeah, chat blues is just amazing. Um, it's also, I find it interesting and from the mythological aspect, which is a lot of what I do, uh, the blues relates to the devil. It's supposedly Robert Johnson was the one who kind of popularized this, but he went to the crossroads, sold his soul to the devil for his musical talent became just a hot shit blues guitarist, like like blues artists today and rock artists and whatever will still look back at him as an inspiration because he was just so damn good. Um, like Eric Clapton, who was a big guitar player in the 60s and 70s and 80s uh, has since gone a little nuts, but you know, big deal musician in the classic rock days. He redid this song Crossroads because he was such a, a Robert Johnson fan. But yeah, Johnson sold his soul to the devil, became really talented, and then died horribly and mysteriously like three, four years later when supposedly the devil came to collect. So there is a tradition of mysticism and kind of magic and the supernatural influencing the blues a little bit, which being a person who deals with a lot of that stuff and finds it interesting, I love that. Um, here is an example of B.B. King, probably the most famous blues guitarist at least for us, uh, doing Lucille, which I believe you would guess from the title, it's a song about his woman. I believe Lucille is the name of his guitar. And then you have the rules of the blues, which are just some jokes. Uh, one of my favorites is, if your name is Tiffany, Amber, or Madison, you cannot sing the blues, no matter how many men you shoot in Memphis. It, it's just some jokes. Um, yeah, enjoy that. So the blues, it's, it's really impactful. It's really amazing. And then you get jazz. And jazz is important because amongst other things, jazz kind of made American culture in as much as um, jazz being in the 20s, 30s, 40s, post-World War I. And France at that time was kind of the, the arbiter of culture. You know, if France says it's cultural and it's important, then it's obviously cultural and important. And so... France kind of made America, before that America was a backwater. It was out in the boonies. It was those, those hicks over there. But with jazz, the French especially started going, oh, this is, this is art. And they started going, America has culture. America has material to share with the rest of the world. It was also around the same time that film noir was again extolled in France as like this is the height of cinema this is really impactful stuff and in both of these cases it was meant for mass entertainment jazz is what you played in clubs to dance to film noir was excuse me um it was just film it was entertainment it was you know for the little people but these scholars again especially French scholars went no this is this is high art this is expressing the will of the people it's it's combining these new things and so it kind of put America on the map. And it's one of our greatest cultural exports. Um, and you get people like Louis Armstrong. Uh, yeah, interesting story about Louis Armstrong. He's famous for scatting, which is um, when you basically make the sound of the instrument with your mouth. Um, and supposedly, the, the way the story goes, he was late to stage coming back from a break. Like they, they took an intermission and they came back and the band was kind of pissy. So the band just started playing without him. He goes, oh shit, and rushes back onto stage. And as he's coming onto stage, he just starts singing his music part, like with his voice and that invents scatting. And according to one version of the story I hold, heard, he was late because he was enjoying a joint out in the uh, in the back alley. So yeah, it, jazz is also where you kind of see the the rise of 
cannabis culture and the the modern day prohibition against it in part because you know it's it was a black drug it was what the blacks smoked when they were doing their jazz jazz cabbage it's been called which is just whether you're pro or against marijuana jazz cabbage is a hell of a name uh the devil's lettuce that that's just fun that's good clean wholesome fun um yeah so jazz really influential really powerful i personally don't like it that much i'm not a jazz person but it evolves into things like the big band swing which gets reinvented in the 90s with ska that i love you know that's right up my alley um bebop which kind of devolves or not devolves uh changes a bit into boogie woogie and so we saw some of that um other styles, reggae, rock, soul, all of these are inspired, at least not necessarily by jazz, but again, by black culture. Um, yeah, many early rock numbers were just remade versions of the blues, uh, and then it kind of developed into its own thing. Punk rock, rap, rap is obviously borrowed from jazz heavily, quite heavily. Um, contemporary music, there's just so much more. This video is from The Daily Show. Uh, and it's just a little bit of, just a little bit of stuff about the uh, the history of HBCU marching bands. And I find it really fascinating. And again, it goes back to that point of black culture and African-American culture have so heavily influenced America and all of the American ideals to the point that I remember being in high school and seeing our you know marching bands do similar stuff to this that is a direct borrowing from these historically black colleges and universities. So, yeah. Um, and then this one's from a comedy thing. It's, as it turns out, uh, classical music is more influential than you might have thought. That's that's all that that really is, but it's, it's funny. I enjoy it. Um, oh, I need to change the damn name on that. I forgot. Um, I, so we also take a look at some, I'll, I've given you some examples of music videos uh, just to, to get an idea of basically where we've taken music and how music changes. Um, Cowboy Bebop is a great example because it's an anime about space bounty hunters that is all about jazz. Like each, each episode of the 13-ish, I think, or 26, I think 13. <clears throat> is heavily, heavily influenced by jazz. Um, well, not every episode. Some are more samba, some are more, uh, I don't know, classical, but all of them are, the music is deeply embedded into it. Uh, the director, whose name escapes me at the moment, also did a show called Samurai Champloo, which was uh, Edo area, like 16 to 1800s, samurai influenced by rap. And so it's instead of, you know, space cowboys and jazz, it's samurai and rap. And it's really good. Um, one of the one of the characters fights in like a breakdancing type style that he just invented. Uh, then you get things like Thriller, Michael Jackson. It is it is a movie in miniature. The song doesn't even start until like five minutes in out of a 13 minute video. Um, also, I just it always amuses me. The video starts with I'll, I'll pull it up. I wish to stress that this film in no way endorses a belief in the occult. Yeah, Michael, because we really thought you were turning into a zombie. Thank you for that explanation. Otherwise, I would have been sure you were a werewolf and promoting the lycanthropic lifestyle. Whatever. It was the 80s, the satanic panic, uh, a lot of stupidity. But say what you will about Jackson, and you can say a lot. The man could dance. Uh, he's... Thriller is so influential that if you have any zombie movie in the modern day, if it's got the least bit of humor in it, if you're not just playing it completely serious, they will dance. They at least some person will do that thing, you know, or the, you know what I mean? Uh, it's, it's everywhere. It's hugely influential. And it's, I like music videos because they combine music and film and dance all in the same, which is a big idea that the arts mix, the arts merge together. That's something we talk about. 
Uh, and then there's Interstellar 5555, which is where you get the songs Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger, and One More Time. And it is a, it's a movie. It's a 90-minute movie about a, an alien band getting captured and saved and all this stuff that is only done with song, only done with music video. It is, it's a modern-day opera. Uh, and I think that's just really damn cool. Um, and so, yeah, every, every piece of dialogue or whatever is music. So it's, it's a neat one. Um, the last piece I will, I will close this out with is John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds. I will have you know that, start over. I will have you know this is the only piano piece, piece that I can play. And here's the idea that everything we do is music. I will give you a hint, this is a postmodern piece. And now a performance of John Cage's 433. Please welcome our soloist, William Marks. That's kind of loud. Sorry about that. So we'll only listen to the first movement, but I think you'll get the, the gist of the piece. Listen closely. And that was the first movement. Right, I'll stop it there, um, but you get the idea. It's four minutes and 33 seconds of silence. Except it's not silence, is it? You hear things. You hear people sniffling in the audience. You hear the sound of the, the recording equipment kind of humming, that staticky sound. Uh, you maybe hear the air conditioner around you or the heater or you know whatever's going on in your room or your house. Possibly the kids running around screaming while you're trying to listen to this very deep and insightful, you know, music piece, as the case may be. But this, this silence, is it not musical? What defines something as music? There's noises. There's everything. If can everything we do be considered music? And that's kind of the gist of it. And that's what postmodernism is if not specifically all about music, but you know, if you need a, a paragraph explanation of what the hell's going on, you've probably got postmodernism on your hands. Um, but what, one thing I love in this is some guy coughs and some lady goes, shh, as if they're going to miss the music. And I, I don't know, it's just a neat explanation or exploration of what music is and what the arts are. And, and it's a great example of postmodernism. So I'll close this off there, but hopefully you found, watch these videos, uh, you know, I'm giving you an excuse to watch music. So it's, or listen to music. So it's pretty cool, but watch these. And I hope you found this uh, insightful or interesting. I hope you learned something. So I will see you next time. Take care.